So last week I chaired the PBAC, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. We considered some over $2 billion worth of expenditure uh, um, for pharmaceuticals uh, over the next five years. And there were three things that came out of that and come out of most of the meetings that we have. We meet with, pa we meet with patient groups and there's a great deal of frustration among patient groups about, particularly those with people with rare diseases, about the lack of attention to research in those areas. The second is there's an extraordinary amount of uh, research which is contributing to some really exciting therapies which are coming forward. The third thing is, however, that when we look at the evidence about the applicability of that, um, it's usually got large gaps in it and it's quite very frustrating as a decision maker not to have clear evidence around that. And Elizabeth, I think you've just beautifully illustrated that in a more general sense, talking about the value there. So where to from here? The, the speakers that today, to, to now have described what they have, would like to achieve at this gathering. The purpose of the day is to pause and reflect on what has been achieved so far, which the next speakers will present before morning, to, morning tea. This day is also an opportunity to see what else needs to be done to ensure New South Wales becomes a global leader uh, in health and medical research, leveraging our strengths and accelerating areas of potential. And you'll be challenged to explore this in the workshops after, after lunch. We will then bring these ideas together in the afternoon with a plan of action. We're looking forward to your contributions to this day. Just so we're all on a level playing field about where we are in New South Wales at the moment, we have four presentations now to describe some of the things which are happening in New South Wales to give a sense of that. And the first of those presentations will be from Dr Kerry Chant, the Chief Health Officer. So firstly, um, let me also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge both Ministers, Minister Goward and Minister Skinner. Uh, also Dr Tony Penner, the Director of the Office of Health and Medical Research and Professor Mary O'Kane. And most importantly, welcome you all here today. Um, my task is a difficult one, which is to set the scene, and I want to apologise ahead of time if I don't mention your particular um, high-end initiative, but I'm going to give a Cook's tour of some of the shining lights. But before doing so, I'd like to indicate the complexity of the environment in which we're operating. The health and medical research ecosystem is a dynamic one. The way in which health care is provided and population health issues are addressed is changing. The burden of chronic diseases is growing and this requires integrated approaches to care delivery across the primary care, hospital and aged care sectors. The ageing profile of the population presents significant challenges of how best to achieve healthy ageing. The need to adopt a transdisciplinary approach in order to secure health outcomes is becoming increasingly acknowledged as we develop care models. For example, when we're supporting vulnerable families through sustained home visiting, we will be keen to ensure children are accessing early childhood education as the evidence is strong that this supports outcomes for the child. Technological advances are also presenting many opportunities for consumers to be better supported in the management of chronic conditions. Newer technologies such as genomics and proteomics raise important questions of how to use these tools to support improved health outcomes. There are also opportunities for innovations in the way we undertake research. The increasing movement towards electronic medical record systems opens up opportunities to create virtual clinical registries, utilising data linkage and also aid clinical trial recruitment. New and adaptive clinical trials methods may also allow us to get answers more quickly and cost effectively, particularly in the area of rare diseases. The Commonwealth Government and the NHMRC are also currently formulating new strategic directions and funding programs to support research. We are currently awaiting the outcomes of the initial consultation on the NHMRC grant funding program review and a decision in relation to the Medical Research Future Fund strategic directions. The NHMRC has also opened a second round of calls for advanced health research translation centres, currently a recognition scheme. So I would like to indicate that the health and medical research system in New South Wales is a vibrant one. 
But again, the challenge I put to you today is how can we further strengthen the system in New South Wales to position us for now and the future? New South Wales has many natural strengths, such as a large and diverse population, a quality health and education system, an attractive environment in which to live and work. In addition, we have other strengths, disciplines that support health and medical researchers such as engineering and computing are strong. ResMed and Cochlea, two major international medical device companies are based here. ANSTO and CSIRO are located here. We have strong statewide clinical networks in many disciplines, including cancer, and we have invested in clinical trials infrastructure. We have, engaged health, we have engaged health system managers and the capacity to implement positive research learnings at scale through our local health districts and specialty networks. We have strong data linkage capability and a driving implementation of statewide electronic medical record systems. We have traditionally done well in relation to population and health system research. A number of the national centres are located in New South Wales, for example, the National Centre for Immunisation Research at Westmead Precinct, the Kirby Institute at University of um, New South Wales, which has a focus on hepatitis B, C, HIV and STIs. Sydney University has also a number of centres, particularly in the area of obesity and prevention research. So today is about us thinking of how we can capitalise on this environment to continue our progress. In 2012, New South Wales embarked on a 10-year plan for health and medical research with the strategic review panel chaired by Mr Peter Wills. To strengthen the focus on health and medical research, the Office of Health and Medical Research was established in New South Wales Health. However, strong links were maintained with the New South Wales Chief scientist and engineer through ongoing collaboration on a range of initiatives, in particular the Medical Device Fund and the Centre for Medicinal Cannabis. We are halfway through this journey and it is timely to pause, acknowledge and reflect on our progress, what we are doing well, what we can enhance and what else should we be doing. We have undertaken a range of initiatives to strengthen and incentivise collaboration, strengthen workforce capabilities and strategically invest in system enablers such as biobanking, improved data linkage, genomics and proteomics, and funding programs such as the MDF, the Medical Research Support Program, and the Translational Research Grants Program. A significant amount of work is also being undertaken in the area of reform of clinical trials, and Dr Penner will talk to this in his presentation. The need for increased collaboration was identified as a strong theme in this strategic review. A New South Wales hub strategy was developed to enhance strategic partnerships and collaborations between local health districts, universities, medical research institutes and other health and research organisations. The success of Sydney Health Partners in achieving NHNMRC recognition as an advanced health research translation centre demonstrates the benefits to be achieved when we collaborate and the health system takes a leadership role. The emphasis on real and effective collaboration has been built into a number of our funding programs, such as the Translational Research Grant Scheme and the Genomics Collaborative. <coughs> Increasingly, the New South Wales Health is working effectively with university and community partners to ensure evidence-based policy and practice and partnering in practical research. The example of the HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis trial led by Professor David Cooper at the Kirby Institute in partnership with community organisations, specifically ACON, and private GPs and our sexual health clinics across our local health districts is a shining example. Over 3,800 people have been recruited into this study across 21 sites in 35 weeks. And this study has a bold aim of reducing HIV transmission by 50%. Professor O'Kane will talk about the MDF later, but a key strength of this program is the ability to connect researchers and industry to clinicians and the patients who are expected to use the technology to provide input into its development. Establishing these connections early 
has supported the effective commercialisation of a number of pro products. A particular favourite of mine, and I'm sorry for my bias, is the Translational Research Grant Scheme, which is a new scheme that fosters evidence translation in the health system. The research question is driven by the health system needs and the research is co-designed by LHDs and researchers. Importantly, how positive research findings are to be sustainably implemented and scaled is a consideration at the beginning of the research project development, avoiding the problem of research evidence being generated but not implemented, which we too often see. A unique characteristic of the scheme is that the CEs, and I note a number in the room, are required to implement the interventions shown to represent value to the health system, including the provision of funding. As a result of the lessons learnt in the round one, we have worked with the Sachs Institute to develop a translational research framework to assist the applicants. It helps to refine research questions, identify research methods, and particularly enhance our capacity to understand how to scale up innovations for greatest impact. We will continue to look at how we can support this program in terms of workforce development and capability. Funding has been provided to support a range of initiatives in the areas of genomics and proteomics. A medical genomics reference bank has been established by the Garvin and has currently sequenced over 2,000 genomes. The New South Wales Genomics Collaborative Grants Program, which commenced in 2014, has supported research into a range of areas, including ways to explore better treatments for cancer, mitochondrial disease, inherited heart disease in babies, schizophrenia, drug-resistant childhood onset epilepsy, skeletal disorders and inherited cardiomyopathies. The Genomics Cancer Medicine Program opened two studies to recruitment in October this year. The Molecular Screening and Therapeutics Study aims to provide tumour profiling and matched targeted therapies for 1,000 patients with advanced cancers, with a particular emphasis on rare or neglected cancers. And the Cancer Risk in Young study aims to understand the genetic basis for cancer arising in people under 40 years of age. An exciting joint project between the Children's Medical Research Institute and the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, uh, Research in Cancer Proteomics will enable comprehensive analysis of childhood and young adult cancers using state-of-the-art facilities housed at the CMRI and the Garvin. And this initiative was established as part of the Moonshot program that the Minister spoke about earlier. There has also been investment in pathogen genomics, which looks at how we can use genomics of organisms to better detect outbreaks and speed up our ability to identify the source and hence stop the outbreak in its tracks. This technology has application for both hospital and community outbreaks. And today I'm releasing a report into the Sydney CBD Legionnaire's disease outbreak, which used this cutting edge pathogen genomics to complement our epidemiological investigation. We have invested in a range of workforce initiatives to support workforce development across the research spectrum from basic science to population health. These include bioinformatics training, training to support commercialisation and the Medical Device Fund program, and more recently some tools to support workforce capability in the area of health services translational research. The Early to Mid-Career Fellowship Program aims to develop capacity in health services and population health research, and the program received over 280 applications, and announcements of successful applicants is due shortly. The program was informed by LHDs and the hubs. The New South Wales PhD Scholarship Program is due to be launched shortly, and I wish to acknowledge the strong contribution of the New South Wales universities in the development and planned implementation of this program. A major component of this program is skill development to support evidence translation in the health system. New South Wales Health is committed to supporting high quality research and evaluation through the use of data and analytics. 
Health Statistics New South Wales is our open data portal for aggregate data, providing a one-stop shop for population-based information and is updated fortnightly. A new portal for cancer statistics is also being developed to make access to data even easier. And the New South Wales Health Analytics Strategy aims to support streamlined access to more timely data for health systems and for, to support research. New South Wales Health has an internationally recognised data linkage capability and about half a billion half a billion linked records are released annually for research and policy purposes. New South Wales is producing more scientific publications than any other jurisdiction using linked data. We are working closely with other jurisdictions on large scale national pilots and are part of a national data linkage network to enable access to cross jurisdictional data. Increasingly, New South Wales government agencies are sharing and linking data to enable cross-sectoral research analytics, identifying opportunities to improve clinical care and driving innovation. New South Wales Health is rolling out a range of electronic, clinical and community reporting systems, such as the electronic medical record, iPharmacy, a community outpatient data system, an ICU data system, to name a few. This investment, when combined with data linkage capability, affords new opportunities for novel research methods which are cost and time efficient. New South Wales Health has also recognised the importance of biobanking to support research from basic research through to health system and population health research. The establishment of a statewide, state-of-the-art biobank, supported by an efficient system of, of specimen collection, informed by research and needs, the annotation of specimens with outcome data and genomic data, and the increased visibility of the range and nature of specimens held in biobanks, will give New South Wales researchers a competitive advantage. Today is an opportunity to pause, acknowledge, reflect and consider what we collectively should be doing, new things we should start doing or things that require a different approach. The challenge I put to you today is how we can further strengthen the vibrant health and medical research system in New South Wales to position us for now and the future. Also reflecting on my opening comments, the health and research medical system needs to be resilient and responsive one, given the complex dynamic environment in which we operate. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. And now to give us an update on uh, things in relation to clinical trials, we have Dr. Antonio, well, actually known only to all of us as Tony, but to his mother as Antonio Penna to talk. It's Tonino. <laughs> so um, uh, I acknowledge both ministers, Elizabeth and Kerry, and all distinguished guests. I'd, I'd also like to pay my respect to the tr uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we stand and to the elders past and present. So the clinical trials are a significant research translation tool. In uh, the 14-15 financial year, we had 256 clinical trials. Uh, they were approved by over 20 odd uh, HREC or Human Research Ethics Committees. In the time avail available, I'll give you a whirlwind tour of some of the key state and national initiatives to improve the conduct and management of clinical trials. Clinical trials vary in complexity from simple, small, comparative effect effectiveness trials to global multi-centre adaptive clinical trials. The infrastructure and processes supporting clinical trials, human data and capital, vary enormously within institutions, between institutions and in Australia between jurisdictions. Timeliness, reliability and quality systems are key elements of many of the reform objectives. Some would say better, faster and cheaper. Many clinical trials are multi-site, multi-jurisdictional, and to become a leader in clinical trials in New South Wales, New South Wales has to work with the other states on improvement initiatives. The Office for Health and Medical Research has been involved in many initiatives over the past three to four years. Our office works with the national bodies and working groups, as well as the local health districts and the New South Wales research hubs, 
which include LHCs, universities and MRIs, and the Cancer Institute of New South Wales. We involve and consult peak bodies and members of the pharmaceutical industry and, and medical devices industry, and as do the Cancer Institute of New South Wales, the CTJWG, which is the working group in the Commonwealth, CTAC, which is the, uh, the Clinical Trials uh, um, uh, Advisory Committee, and, so, and also LHDs. New South Wales was instrumental in establishing the National Clinical Trial Jurisdictional Working Group in late 2013. The working group is charged with reducing the inter-jurisdictional barriers to conduct of clinical trials. Its members include the jurisdictions, Commonwealth Department of Health and NHMRC. The four key areas was focusing on uh, metric systems uh, and establishing a metric system, promoting ICT interoper uh, interoperability, enhancing, uh, second, enhancing national consistency for ethics, governance and contract negotiations, improving efficiency of recruitment and accruals, and strategy for positions in Australia is a good place to conduct clinical trials. A draft report on, uh, on the National Aggregate Statistics or KPIs in clinical trials has been produced and will provide basis of a national dashboard on clinical trial performance. Hopefully you'll see it sometime next year. The collaboration between the jurisdictions has been extraordinary, in particular working on the metrics, key standard operating procedures, roles and responsibility documents which we shared across the, across the country. In the next four slides, I'll highlight some of the initiatives that have been planned or have been undertaken. The office has worked with uh, CTJWG to expand national mutual acceptance for human research, research ethics reviews to include all research. The Southern Eastern Border States, SEBS panel, has re have representatives from, the, from the, uh, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and Victoria, and it works to standardise as far as possible the terms and conditions of the Medicines Australia trial research agreements. The local health districts are moving site governance from hospital towards centralised governance at the LHD level. An initiative driven by a partnership between two LHDs, such as uh, the Clinical Trial Refer app, has revolutionised the recruitment of patients to clinical trials, the focus being one of cross-referral of patients to trials within a clinical network. It provides easy access to clinical trial information for clinicians and patients and the ability to refer and link into trials, a key outcome being a reduction in the number of trial sites creating efficiencies as a result of, of economies of scale. The Commonwealth Department of Health is driving a new initiative to support the, uh, the centralisation of clinical trial support functions and uh, the clinical trials coordination units, thereby improving more reliable and consistent support within and between institutions. The NHMRC has further developed the Australian Clinical Trials Portal, which provides comprehensive information on clinical trials and education and training resource materials. The office has been working towards the procurement of a new statewide research ethics and governance information system. A vendor will soon be chosen and the system will be commissioned in 2017. The system will have the capabilities of the central allocation of ethics reviews. It'll, be more, it'll provide a more effic uh, efficient, effective and intuitive system. The office will soon release a consultation paper, paper a framework for early phase clinical trials in New South Wales. One of the key guiding principles is reducing the administrative burden in the approval and conduct of early phase, phase trials. The initial consultation with 60 or so key stakeholders, including pharmaceutical and medical device companies, has identified the need to provide best practice guidelines which align with best practice internationally and nationally. The implementation of this key initiative will provide a platform for significant improvement reforms for the other clinical, uh, clinical trial phases. The Cancer Institute New South Wales has an incentive patient recruitment funding scheme for the support of investigator-led trials. It provides core funding as well as funding based on patient recruitment. A translation cancer research centre in the state based, um, based in an ethnic diverse community has focused on the recruitment of patients from non-English non, non speaking backgrounds using the community and primary health networks to successfully recruit patients into, into trials. I'm just giving a lot of initiatives run, running through, but we'll see how we go. A CTJWG commissioned a report scoping uh, uh, and analysis of recruitment and retention in Australian clinical trials. It was clear that there were great and varied initiatives in the conduct and management of clinical trials scattered across Australia. There is best pra practice in our backyard. 
we need to work together and learn from each other. It's a key question and issue that comes through to me all the time, that the best practice is here, whether it's in this state or interstate, it's here. T timeliness of approvals and authorisation are probably the most vexed issues for researchers. New South Wales Health has incorporated key performance indicators in local health district performance agreements around ethics and governance approval times and clinical trial recruitment. New South Wales has also provided funds to the LHDs to assist in meeting these KPIs. The first report will be available in, in, in early 2017. The office will, with the assistance of the LHD governance and ethics staff, has, has reformed the site-specific assessment form, voila, says everybody, and will work with the LHDs in reforming the authorisation processes. Most importantly, to engage senior LHD exec executives in the review of uh, these site-specific approvals. The NHMRC will soon implement the new Human Research Ethics ap Application Form to replace the much maligned uh, NEF. And a number of LHCs have uh, reformed their research governance structures to include executive review and approval of clinical research prior to research eth ethics and traditional governance approval process. It has improved the timeliness of approvals and also provided assistance in improvement of research design and methodology. Our LHDs are very engaged in further embedding research in our health system to drive improvements and innovation in patient care and population health. With executive involvement in governance, I can see the bane of researchers almost disappear overnight and timeliness of clinical trial approvals become no longer a topic of conversation and angst. Rapid change can occur with the renewing of mindsets and establishment of good structures and processes. It requires coordination, collaboration and willingness to share learnings and initiatives. And we have it here in New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Sally Redmond. Sally was chatting with me before the meeting this morning and uh, she was complaining about the fact that she didn't know why they'd ask her to talk this morning. She didn't know anything about the topic. And this coming from a woman who was recently, as in the last 10 days, recognised by the National Heart Foundation for the contributions that she's made to research leadership, particularly in translational research. Sally. Thanks, Andrew. And I do feel a bit of a ring in, so um, apologies in advance. Um, look, I'd also like to start by um, uh, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and uh, to, um, to acknowledge the presence at this meeting of Minister Skinner, Minister Goward and, uh, and Elizabeth Coff. Um, it is actually really a privilege to speak this morning because I think it's a really fantastic gathering and I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all of those wonderful um, examples that we've already heard of the way in which New South Wales is providing leadership and striding ahead in, in health and medical research. So look, I, I just wanted to start by um, a, a making a point that in fact Elizabeth already made, which is that when we think about translation research, we have to start really from at, we have to think about it at all, in relation to all kinds of research and at all stages of the pathway from uh, basic discoveries through to the kinds of changes that we make in policy at the state and federal level. And this morning I have to acknowledge that I'm probably going to focus a bit on the last two steps, the translation of research into health services and health systems and into policy. So okay, it's always interesting to think why we're we talking about translational research, but I think the reason for this is that historically there has been a long time between the discovery of a, of a, of a new development through research and its adoption in practice. So, for example, it was 50 years from when Richard Dole showed that asbestos played a key role in the development of lung cancer before we managed to ban asbestos in Australia. That's a long time. So, I think we are doing better. There's lots of new examples of more rapid translation. For example, with the HPV vaccine, I think the main discoveries were made during the 1980s, and you can see that by 20 years later, in 2007, Gardasil had been added to the National Immunisation Programme. That's much quicker, um, but I think there still remains a fair bit to do in this space. And I wanted to um, 
so before moving into talking about some of that, I wanted to acknowledge that one of the really important developments I think has been uh, both, I think almost every speaker has referred to this, but the really transformative um, changes in the way that research and evidence is valued by the health system. I do think New South Wales has been a leader in this and uh, really stemming from the Garling Review um, through Peter, your really important reports, if we look at just a few examples, so in the LHD service agreements with the Ministry, the importance of evidence-based care delivery is emphasised. Kerry mentioned the Translational Research Grant Scheme and the commitment that the CEs of the LHDs have made to acting on the outcomes of research. For me, it's amazing that we had 330 applications to that scheme, and it shows, in fact, how committed the CEs are to developing and using research in their, in their work. As part of the um, uh, Centre of Research Excellence at the Sachs Institute, we surveyed um, quite a large number of staff and a range of policy organisations in New South Wales. And you can see from the slide that the staff really have in their hearts this uh, commitment to using research. They told us that they find research valuable in deciding about policies and also that their organisation expected that they would use research in informing their policy and programs. I think this is a big change in the past decade or two. So the office asked me to talk a little bit about what we could do to strengthen our effort in translation, building on this really strong base that we've already heard about this morning. Um, I've chosen four things. I think that probably almost everybody in the room would have a different selection of things. So I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot that can be done in this space. But for me, there's three or four things that I think really light the heart of our effort in, the, in this space. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is building partnerships and co-production. So we've heard so many examples of this already this morning. Kerry, you gave us many examples of this in particular. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the idea of co-production and co-creation. So there's a really interesting recent paper by Trish Greenhow, who'd be known to many people in this room, in which I think she sort of captures this. She talks about the sort of magic that happens when researchers, and she talks about policymakers, but I think we can just read end users of research here, service service deliverers, program planners come together to work together over a long period of time to understand each other's worlds, to generate research together and then use the findings of that research. In that sense, it's not really translation where you found something in the research world and you're kind of pushing it out to be taken up in the health service delivery system. It's more a matter of a much more organic approach to generating knowledge together. So, you know, people have spoken a lot recently about co-production of, um, of knowledge and I guess this means that people, researchers and users of research are involved all the way along the research production continuum. I think there's a few things that we could do in this space to strengthen our effort despite what we've already heard about the great strides we've made. So one of them is I think we have to acknowledge that this is, these are not necessarily skills that come naturally to all of us. We could do much to build the skills of our workforce, particularly perhaps our university workforce and working with policy. I'm really pleased to say the Sachs Institute's about to announce a program in this space, and I think that we can also do things to help policy agencies and service providers understand the constraints that fit, sit upon researchers. Could also think a bit about governance in this space. And I think also funding is really important, and I'll say a word about this um, towards the end. The second thing that I wanted to, to talk about this, uh, this morning is really, can we take every time we make an innovation and turn it into an opportunity from learning for learning? So this is not so much research out there, but it's can we embed research really in the structure of the way that we innovate within the system? So I think actually we, you know, generally thinking about the health system and health service research, we have a real lot to learn from clinical research here. For many years, many clinicians have, particularly clinical trialists, have talked about when you do something different with a patient, you're actually placing them in an experiment and we should use that as an opportunity to learn. I think we could take that as the same sort of way of thinking within the health system. I know at the Innovation Summit last, last week or the week before, and in fact, just from talking to my colleagues in the health system, that innovation is really constant in our system. Can we do some things to make sure that we build research in every time we think about innovation? 
uh, I think it was Kerry mentioned um, the work that we've been doing at the Sax Institute with the Ministry to develop some uh, framework as part of the translational research grant process. And I wanted to show this to you because I think it emphasises the fact that we can learn at all stages of implementation. Often we limit our thinking about research to does this work, but in actual fact there's lots to be learned from thinking about the feasibility of an intervention all the way through to that adoption into what and scale up into the wider system. So if we do this, it means bringing a research framework to each stage of that innovation pathway. Also, there's a few other things I think that we might do to just cement this a little. Um, I think we can, we can embed research questions as we roll out policies and programs. So one of the best examples I know about this is um, some work that was conducted a long time ago by actually Les Uig in conjunction with the development of the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. At that time, we didn't know which of two faecal occult blood tests would be the best to include in the screening program. So because the researchers and deliverers of the program were together around the table in its design, there was an opportunity created to embed a randomised trial within the rollout of the pilot program to test which would be the best uh, FOBT test going forward. We don't really do very much of that, and I think we could do a lot more about more of it if we engaged earlier in the process and we were more flexible about the way policy rollout happened. So if we're going to do that, we're going to need to think about different kinds of methodologies. Randomised trials, important as they are, are probably not going to be the best technique for answering those kinds of questions. And I think, you know, this is the NBN rollout. We often roll out innovation in our health system in that way. Can we use that as an opportunity to understand how to collect better information? And lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge the really important evaluation framework document produced by New South Wales Government. While this is obviously still being implemented, it does create a great framework from learning every time we deliver an innovation within the health system. The third point I wanted to make was just to reflect on the complexity of translation. And actually, Elizabeth mentioned this right at the beginning. You know, we often kind of think of, we've done the difficult research and now we should translate it. But actually, the translation of new findings is really complicated, and I think we need to um, acknowledge that and possibly focus a bit more of our research effort on understanding that translation process. So I think in a long time ago, in 2003, Many people would know um, this really seminal paper that was published by uh, Richard Grohl and Jeremy Grimshaw, which actually analysed um, all of the work that had happened uh, in terms of what works in implementing clinical practice guidelines. They concluded that um, n there was really no one size fits all, that the kind of implementation strategies that you needed depended on the kind of change you were bringing about, and importantly, the characteristics of the local situation. So adopting a change in one hospital might require change among clinicians, it might require change in resourcing, it might be a patient issue. They emphasise the fact that none of the approaches that we have for translation or transferring evidence is superior under all conditions. So I guess this is a bit of a call for, can we think about a new kind of translation research that helps people working at the local level to understand what is going to be most effective for them in translating evidence into practice? Of course, this complexity increases even more once you start to think at a, a, a systems level. So um, this slide uh, on the right-hand slide, right -hand side shows um, a, a dynamic simulation model that, uh, a, a, around our correlated harm. So this has been developed by Joan Atkinson and her colleagues as part of the work of the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. And I just, I just want to say it is complicated. So there are many situations like this where we understand that the determinants of the behaviour that we're trying to change are complex. We know something about what might be effective, but we really struggle to bring all of that information together to give clear 
to, to, to identify clear actions for translation. So we've been really interested in this use of dynamic simulation modelling as one tool for trying to identify the best steps for action. Um, we like it because it enables us to compare different, the different kinds of actions and to explore which of these might be most effective. Obviously it's only as good as the research on which it's based, but nonetheless I think we need to get as we talk about translation, we need to get smarter about this kind of approach. And uh, just before, um, just the last thing to say in relation to complexity is, many people will have seen this slide before, it shows the really dramatic decrease in rates of smoking that have made Australia a leader in the space of uh, tobacco consumption. And it shows all the different actions that have occurred to make that happen. So translation takes a long time and it can require actions by many people at many different levels. Every time I see this slide I'm, I'm reminded that uh, in, uh, the it was not until the 1980s that we actually banned smoking in, um, in uh, domestic flights. It, just, it seems like another world way, doesn't it? But a lot of actions over a long period of time. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is about funding, and I wanted to first to acknowledge all of the great things that have happened over the last, say, 20 years, particularly the last decade, in creating research funding that better links, that better stimulates and supports translation effort and translation research. New South Wales has been a leader in this and the other speakers have highlighted many of those. The TRIGS program has been particularly important because it, it provides a platform for working together in collaboration and co-production and I think some of the NHMRC schemes such as the Prevention Partnership Centres have also been equally important. So I wanted to end with a sort of provocative statement that uh, can we go further in this space? Is there room in Australia for something like the National Institute for Health Research in the UK? This has been a really important initiative, I think, in driving the kind of research that, we're, that we think of as translation research. It's ensured that there's dedicated funding for research that's trans, that translation research from bench to bedside and talks about this in terms of the benefits for the patient and the economy. A recent independent review of this found many, many examples of the impact of the NIHR's research funding over 10 years. So just to end, I just wanted to say that we've heard this morning that lots and lots have been achieved. I think there's still um, some things that we can do and I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion later on today about people's views about those things. Our last presenter to this, this morning um, is uh, Professor Mary O'Kane. And Mary, I apologise that I didn't recognise you at the staff. Mary is the Chief Scientist and Engineer uh, for New South Wales. Um, as Kerry reminded us before, uh, good health and medical research is built on good basic science and engineering, that you can't have development of new drugs um, unless you actually have uh, the technologies, etc., to do that. I'm also impressed that, Mary, that uh, your role, in fact, encompasses other aspects of health, and I'm thinking here of the inquiry, uh, and the report and review that you did into coal seam gas and fracking, and the importance that, and the, and the tricky balance there are between weighing up the sort of public health benefits and the other benefits to the community. So it'd be good to hear from you talking about medical devices fund and commercialisation. Ministers, colleagues, in speaking, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. The story of the Medical Devices Fund is in one way a very simple one, and it comes, there's, there's a lot to the back, in the background of it, but one important piece of background is of course that Australians say we're very bad at commercialisation. And even though we've had a lot of emphasis on biotechnology, and we've ha seen a lot of companies uh, floated on the stock exchange in the biotech space. There haven't been a lot of successes with a couple of notable exceptions, Cochlear, ResMed, and um, there's, a, there's a couple of others, but they're not quite so much devices. So I was a bit worried and startled when, when the government came in Minister Skinner called me in and asked me would I chair the medical devices panel and she said the task was quite simple. We were to create the next cochlea. Um, and so what did that mean? The, obviously, um, 
Uh, well, I mean, when I say she said create the next cochlear, I should mention that all things in the Ministry of Health, they're very professional. So it was rapidly translated into um, priority recommendations that came out of the wills review. Well, I think Minister Skinner had been thinking about it for a bit longer, a long time in opposition had given her time to think. Um, it was about development commercialisation, it was support for individuals for the research system, and it was to be taken up into the health system. All that was very important in what she said we were to do. Um, and it was discussed a lot in that wills review, and it's been talked about quite a bit, but that was a really important scene-setting review that Peter chaired, and um, that gave us a lot of context in which to think about this sort of thing. So what do you do when you, you told you to create the next cochlear? Um, it, it wasn't just one. It was the next cochleurs, I think, too. So first of all, you need a tremendous group of people to help. And the minister put together a, a group. Um, it's, we've added to it, and um, a couple of my colleagues in that are here today. Greg Keogh's in front of me. He joined in the second year. Um, John Mattick joined this year. And we had Adam Spencer, who, um, who's left because he moved, but he still uh, chairs our, our wonderful functions when we have them. But I, I think it was a good group, and when we're looking at what we can learn from things like this, I think it's often important to see you know, what people you bring in. It was really important to, to have the expertise, both technological and financial, of the two big success companies. It was tremendously important, which is why we asked Greg to join us, to actually have clinical experience and a deep link into the clinical sector. Um, Michael still has been an absolute rock right through it. He understood what we were trying to do in, big build, in building big companies, as did Neville. And then more recently, we asked John to join us because the de our definition of device has always been very broad. It includes things that come from data, come from software, come from genomics. And so we needed to get that sort of expertise into the system. We were brilliantly supported by the Office of Health and Medical Research by Tony Penner, Anne O'Neill, and they've taken the ideas and built on them. And an important aspect of this that the Minister, that Minister Skinner spoke about before is that it's um, that there's, we really recognised early, and this was very much the Office of Health and Medical Research, the need for training. That, and I guess that's something that comes through in Australia generally, and I'll return to it later. We also recognised relatively early the, um, the tremendous importance of getting good reviews of the products from people who might use them. So a lot of clinicians right through the New South Wales health system have been co-opted to write reviews of the various proposals that have come forward, and I wanted to say a big thanks to them. Another thing we do is have a subcommittee of the main panel, that because we get a very large number of applications, well, between 100 and 200 a year, and brings them down to a, to sh to a short list, and Anne O'Neill chairs that. So now I move to the main part of what I want to say. And, what, and that was having got this great group together to choose, having put good support structures in place, having put very good application processes in place, how did we actually work out what we were, what we were judging? And in a lot of, in, in many ways you could say, were we being asked to be a, another venture capital fund? I work three days a week as chief scientist and engineer here in the city of Sydney. I'm in the MLC building across the way there. If I go down to the bottom of the MLC, there's a, a wash of cash around the bottom of the MLC. Sydney, as um, various ministers, particularly Minister Goward noted, is a, a big investment centre. It's a, it's a, there's lots and lots of venture capital cash out there. It's how do you get it? We decided we weren't going to be a venture capital fund. We were going to try and do something different because we noted the venture capital process wasn't working particularly well. So what did we do? First of all, um, we, we needed to see that um, there were certain conditions met. We decided we'd check for these, but they weren't going to be the determining factor. So we needed to know that there was a genuine clinical need, that there was a need in the market, and that the device proposed was better than its competitors, and that the group could 
tell us about the international market. We needed to know that they had a licence to operate in intellectual property terms, that they had a clear licence out there, that their company, and they all had to be companies, um, was in a, a sound financial position, and that they had good management. You note in there, I haven't said anything about research quality, that was a, a, a precondition that was wrapped up in the quality of the device that's there. Now I come to the main point for the, of our judgement, and it is this. It's, will our funds, with their proposal, lead to a, a significant jump on the technology readiness scale? Will they jump up one or two levels? And we thought that was the most important thing because many of us on that panel have been involved over the years in medical devices and in their commercialisation and, and the launching of companies. There's a lot of expertise in that panel. And one of the things we find is companies make a great start, great idea, nice, nice little demonstration somewhere, but have a lot of problem getting to scale, getting to full robustness, getting to full trial, clinical trials, and getting full acceptance in the market through standards and so on. So this was tremendously important. For those of you who and maybe have not been, are not familiar with the technology readiness scale, there are many slight variations on it. Um, you see ones from NASA, you see ones from various energy bodies, you see it in, now adopted in a lot of Australian bodies. But basically it, it's the levels that go from basic research up through demonstrators, up through prototypes, right through to complete systems, and then a system working in the complete operational environment. And we've been pleased that that's what we chose. And we've kept to it right through. We haven't changed the way we've done this for some years. We're very, very nervous, I have to say. And we, I wish the ministers had just put their hands over their ears for a couple of minutes. Um, because one of the amazing things about this fund, we've yet to have one of the companies fall over. And it's so it's you know where we hope we're on to something quite important. Of course. We're in the middle of a, a great deal of strength, and you've heard some wonderful explanations of that this morning. I don't need to go through it. There's great strength here in New South Wales, bringing together our medical research institutes, our hospitals, universities, the PFRAs and so on. There's a great suite of New South Wales government programs in the Ministry of Health, in, our, in other ministries. And there's a lot of Commonwealth programs and international programs. Um, we, I mentioned too about the training thing. I'll come to it more in the end. I'm going to very, very quickly slip through the four years. It's going to be a, a rapid run of time. Um, just to give you a sense of the sort of number and size of things we're funding. In our first year, we funded five uh, projects. Um, one of those was for $200,000. The largest one was for $5 million. Um, at the, in these next uh, few slides, I show the projects funded and then some of the good things that happened. I mean, down here, I, I note there a second from the bottom that um, two of the, the uh, recipients were able to come back with totally new things, to new devices. Saluda has been one of our great successes. It was our largest grant and has gone from strength to strength in terms of the money it's received and the way it's going, and was a is a, I guess you know possibly could be the next cochlear. The next year we saw so the first year was somewhat diverse in area. The next year, and it's funny how these things happen in funding bodies. Um, we saw quite a lot of, and it's not all clear from the names there, but we saw quite a lot of orthopaedic devices start to come through. So there's clearly a bit of a message in that. Um, we also saw, and maybe one of the most exciting technologies, was Speedex and a way of doing multiple tests in, in parallel in terms of pathology tests. We moved on in 15-16 to a larger number of projects and again quite a few orthopaedic ones. But you start to see things happening that give us a great deal of confidence in some of the things we do and we were particularly thrilled that Atomo um, one of our little darlings also it got a little bit more from somebody else than we gave them. They got six million from the Bill and Melinda Gates 
uh, Foundation and 4.5 from the Global Health Investment Fund. So we we've been sort of we track um, these and very much try and help them further. Um, and in the most recent round, we've seen two of our others back, and um, two that are um, have previously unsuccessful. And this previously unsuccessful issue is an important aspect of where the training program comes in. And that's been a, a complementary program. And there have been um, two, there have been a couple of uh, aspects to it. One of it is the, the great fellowship that the minister talked about, which comes up in an, another slide. And then there's the standard program that's been, that was launched in, in uh, 2014. And does a wonderful job of teaching commercialisation. There's a, a lot of us who work in the commercialisation space know there's various things you can, can teach, but often people find it boring and, and rather dry. What seems to work very well in our case is that, these, that the people going to the training seem to form tight little groups and become friends and supporters of each other. And I think that's been one of the most important things that, as we know in learning, it's often learning from your colleagues that is the most powerful learning of the lot. And we're, we're always amused to see when our grant um, people come to do presentations, they're all saying hello to each other and they all clearly know each other very well as they go in and out the room. Um, the minister spoke about the fellowship um, that came through the partnership with the Rosenman Institute. And all our people involved in this just desperately want to win that fellowship. The opportunity of being able to immerse Australians in some of the great successful um, systems for learning how to commercialise biotechnology that's been happening in, um, that happens in the US is great. And that has been an enormous success. As I said, we've seen all sorts of good things happen. And we've seen, sorry, um, from our, um, yeah, some really nice things have happened actually out of our local program. For example, Dr Mystery being the New South Wales Young Woman of the Year and um, Stephanie Watson's success. And as I said, there's lots of that. Now, on top of all of that, the government this year decided that commercialisation was very important and it actually, using the MDF as an inspiration, decided to create the Sydney School of Entrepreneurship. And um, this was a $25 million grant by the New South Wales government to establish a joint venture between New South Wales universities and TAFE New South Wales to establish an independent entity where um, entrepreneurship can be fostered and trained while people are still doing subjects, their, their standard courses at their home university, but they'll come in to the School of Entrepreneurship. And in many ways, it's somewhat like a, the medical devices training program on steroids. It, it's commencing work probably in, well, in 2017 with the first major courses starting in the second half. And it was modelled loosely on the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship, a joint venture between the five universities of Stockholm. And we're very lucky to have attracted the head of the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship to become the CEO of the Sydney School of Entrepreneurship. And I've asked Nick Kay to, be, to join us today. Nick, where are you? Could you stand up? Yes. So Nick's arrived from Stockholm last week. Um, and we're very much looking forward to working with Nick, both in this area and more generally in commercialisation. So that's, a, that's been a new development this year, and that's, the, as I said, the medical devices going, going global. What can we learn from all this? Obviously, you can learn what Sally said, what Kerry said about collaboration. There's many important things to learn in the area of translation and about how cross-sectoral teams might work. And one of the important things of MDF has been the link between engineering issues to get that scale up along with the medical expertise that has been the basis of the, the developments that have been funded. Um, the training, as I keep saying, has been tremendously important because it's created a pipeline of highly skilled innovators and, commer and commercialisers. And I think um, probably there are questions actually to be thought of in the, um, in the workshops. Are there any lessons from this program and from the other programs we've heard of out of the last uh, three speeches ahead of me? Are there things that we can learn from program across to other program? 
how can we build on the networks that exist here, particularly the networks of young researchers and young people involved in commercialisation? They're the future. How do we make sure they do work as a group, as those groups do work in the commercialisation uh, training program? What do we do to facilitate collaborations in various ways? To Things like today are important, and I'd like to congratulate Minister Goward for holding a day like today. Just getting a room full of people like this is tremendously important in terms of facilitating collaboration. And as I note from my work in MDF and my work racing around in other bits of uh, serving government, is what can we do to facilitate much closer links to industry, and how can we get industry to serve our wonderful health system here in New South Wales? Thank you.